you talk about your um, your love for stoicism or minimalism. Um, so I wanted to pick your brain about that a bit. How has that manifested in your life? And what kind of things have emerged from it um, as a result of practicing it? So what have been some of the second order effects of choosing that lifestyle that might not be obvious for people? Okay. I think yeah, this is something I've never really talked about. Um, so thanks for bringing it out. Um, we often think of minimalism in terms of stuff. Um, but to me, I just find, talk about like the common thread when I look back about what's made me happiest for my whole life. Minimalism is one of those things that just over and over and over again, I just get such joy out of um, seeing what I can do without. So uh, the core idea of minimalism, right? This idea that stuff weighs you down with more downsides than upsides. Like often when we get something in our life, we think of the upside of it. But to me, I see the downsides more than the upsides. So some aspects of this are, um, say taking things seriously. So the, the, I guess these might be like, you call them second order effects. So um, taking things seriously, for example. So considering the long-term impact of things, not just the environmental impact, but like the impact on your psyche of having a thing. Like if I were to hang a clarinet on the wall in front of me right now, that would do something to my psyche. I'd be thinking I should be playing that clarinet or I should be doing something. It's like everything in my life feels like it should have some purpose. So if it's sitting there with no purpose, it's like a little part of my brain is still spinning about that thing. Um, letting go of the unimportant to leave space. So uh, kind of like minimalist music has space between the notes. So I think of that in my own life, like leaving space in my life. That's kind of the hell yeah or no thing. It's like, it, it's okay to like leave your time and your calendar empty. Cause if you have space in your life, then you can throw yourself you all in when you find something great. Um, focusing my attention. So uh, like minimalist art, for example, we'll just put, you know, one single line and a circle. And by doing that, it says like, no, 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 really focus on that and that. And so I think of that in life, like when you get rid of everything else that doesn't matter, you really focus on the few things that are left. Like it's, it's really the, um, I was gonna say what's the opposite of diffused, but I guess it focused is the opposite of diffused. It's a very uh, focused attention. Um, I think it keeps you future focused too, because um, when you're future focused, you're often doing things today in service of your future self, right? You're not living for today. You're living for future you. So being minimalist means that future you will have less to look after, less to maintain, less to store, less to upkeep. Um, uh, you know, we talked about programming for a second before. So having less code today means less that your future self has to maintain and upgrade when packages are upgraded or whatever. Um, so yeah, being minimalist, second order effect, uh, being more future focused. Uh, having less baggage gives you more options in life. So I, I think there are a lot of people I know um, quite well that would consider doing different things in their life, but they live in a big house with a lot of stuff and a big mortgage. And so eh, can't, you know, um, they just have too much stuff that they've grown accustomed to too. So they, they start to think of too many things as necessities. So even the idea of traveling with one bag, they're just like, I, I can't, I need too much stuff every day, but it's because they have too much stuff. So it's, uh, they've reduced their options in life because they have too much stuff. Um, uh, two more, so having a small identity. Um, so instead of saying like, I am a programmer, rock climber, a musician, cyclist, Republican, Buddhist, French film fan, uh, clarinet player. <laughs> um, that's a lot of identity to maintain. Like if you say, I am these things, well then you, that's a lot of actions you're going to have to do to uphold that identity. 
because you can't just keep saying that you are something if your actions are not supporting it anymore. You can't say you're a rock climber if you haven't climbed rocks in 20 years. So by like identity can be baggage. Um, and lastly, um, a second order effect uh, would be more deciding that it means almost every day or very, very often you're making real decisions about what's important and what's not. Um, yeah, deciding what's important and letting go of the rest. Um, yeah, so I, I do this every day. Like I constantly look at everything in my life, like even, you know, that whole uh, list of things I just said. And I think I look at all these things saying, do I really need that? Um, both physical and non-physical, you know? Uh, do I really need these things? Do I really need that identity as part of my identity? Uh, do I really need uh, that code in my site? Do I really need that functionality in my website? Are people using that? If not, get rid of it. Um, do I really need all these old photos? Am I using them? Do I really need, you know, like all of these things. Um, that goes for goals. I, oh, I'm constantly letting go of goals. I, I had tons of past goals that I'm constantly looking through these goals going, do I need that goal anymore? Like, yeah, that was something I wanted to do eight years ago and I haven't done it yet. But every day I keep that goal in my list of goals is... Uh, so it, it does something to my psyche, keeping it there. Um, contacts, I constantly go through my phone. If there's somebody I haven't talked to in a year and I'm like not desperately missing them, I just delete it. So like my phone has, I think 25 contacts in it. That's it, oh, which is wonderful. Um, food, uh, I get rid of every food. I don't like, you know, sometimes I'll buy food thinking, yeah, I'll cook something with that tempeh. You know, it doesn't happen, I get rid of it. Um, plant, habits, there's some habits I just do that maybe started for a good reason long ago, but if I notice that I'm still doing them, but they don't have a place in my life anymore, I get rid of it. My, my phone only has two apps on it because I just realized like all these other apps I don't really use. So I just have the two that I actually use, yeah. God, sorry, that was a really long answer. It no, was a really, good. really good one because uh, kind of grounding it in, in very real life things rather than keeping it abstract, I think is really useful for people because it gives them ideas of how they can do it in their own life if they're considering it. And maybe they don't want to. So like my sister, for example, is the opposite. She lives in a huge house with like four kids and two dogs and tons of stuff. And that makes her happy. And so just because somebody might be a fan of your podcast or something like that doesn't mean that they need to buy into this, you know? Um, or you might just want it in one little aspect of your life. Um, I like it because it, for some weird reason, I, it feels better to me to have less, just in general, at any given moment. I would rather be in an empty room than in a full room. I'd rather have an empty calendar than a full calendar. Some people are the opposite. Like they feel alive when their calendar is full and they feel alive if they have a million contacts in their phone. I feel the opposite. I, I like that space to grow, to change and to focus. Um, also, I really like challenging myself to see what I can do without because the comfort I get from knowing and proving to myself that I don't need something is ultimately greater than the comfort of having it, of having something. You know I mean, it's like a greater comfort to know I don't need it. So I'm constantly pushing myself to see what I don't need. And it's you haven't really uh, uh, talked about this very much, but I really wonder because when when you remove all the stuff and there's all this space, that space is a space of potentiality. So what kind of things emerge from that? It's like uh, if if your every minute of your day is filled with meetings and things, then there's no space for that emergence. I can't help but think of like my own, like this is just applying so much to me right now in like what I need to change. And I'm like trying to focus on an interview, but I'm also like, fuck, man, <laughs> like so many things I'm doing right now. I need to stop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's been a little bit the opposite. Like we've added, I don't know, eight or oh, 10, know. 10 new projects to our <laughs> plate in the last couple months. <laughs> it's an experiment. It's all an experiment. You know, it's funny. I... I'd be the worst 
accountability buddy. I have this one dear friend of mine. She's one of my best friends, but she constantly wants to do that damn accountability partner kind of thing. She's like, oh, Derek, I want to go on a diet. Will you be my accountability buddy? Well, let's go do the diet at the same time and we'll hold each other to keeping to it. I'm like, I don't, I break loyalties every day. Like every day, I, like I'll have, it's something that I felt loyal to sometimes for decades. Like, you know what I just did a few weeks ago? Um, this whole process we're talking about, I just gave away all of my music equipment, everything, all of my guitars, my keyboards, my this, my everything but this microphone, because I thought it might have other non-musical uses, but it was like a, just like two or three weeks ago, I had been feeling this guilt every day about these two guitars that are sitting there that I just haven't been playing. And I say that it's an important value to me, but I'm not actually doing it. And I just, so every day I was, had this little bit of guilt, like I should be spending more time doing that. I should. In fact, when I moved here from New Zealand to Oxford, England, I only, I only own and only brought with me one paper book. And it's still here. It's called Great Songwriting Techniques by Jack Paracone, who is my old songwriting teacher at Berklee School of Music, like whatever, 30 years ago. Um, and it's the only book I, book I brought with me because I still had this in my list of goals. Like, I'm going to get back into songwriting. Like, I wrote 100 songs 20 years ago. I loved it. I still had this as part of my identity. Like, I'm a musician. I'm a songwriter. This is me. So just three weeks ago, when I thought like, no, I really need to be spending more time on songwriting. I, I caught myself thinking like, yeah, but you know, four hours writing a song is four hours I could be spending doing something I really want to do more. I thought, God, I really need to let go of this whole music goal thing. Like I, I need to let this go from my identity. So my best friend here in Oxford is a full-time musician, like a full-time professional musician. This is his living. So I called him up and I was like, How'd you like a couple new guitars? He's like, dude, are you seriously getting rid of your Strat? I want it. I was like, <laughs> you can have my Strat, Tom. And I gave him my Strat. I gave him my wonderful 88 key weighted keyboard and the synth with 20 whatever gigs of sounds. And uh, he's thrilled and he uses it every single day. I even gave him my speakers. I looked at my speakers. I was like, I got headphones. I don't need speakers. And, uh, yeah, I gave it all away. That was like a huge identity thing for me to let go of that. I didn't regret it for one second. Did it... Shit. I even had a dog a few months ago, and then my mom said she was like wanting to adopt a dog. I was like, you know what? I don't really need my dog. You can have my dog. I gave <laughs> I her my that, dog. I thought that story was going to have a much sadder ending to it. You were just like, I just dog. But no, like even my dog. It's like I'd only had him for six months, but I thought I was going to have him for twelve years. He was a puppy, and like, then I just looked at my life and I was like, you know that was a the dog was a hypothesis <laughs> and um my mom and her husband were like out there looking for that exact kind of dog they were going around to dog shelters trying to adopt that kind of dog that i have and i was just like you know what but i'm gonna give you my dog um so yeah i constantly i have no loyalty except to uh my dear friends and family and that's it even identities habits goals no loyalty the brand new Future Thinkers Members Portal is now live. Develop your sovereignty and self-knowledge with our in-depth courses, get access to our weekly sense-making calls, join the Q&As with past podcast guests, and much more. Become a Future Thinkers member today at futurethinkers.org slash members. To stay up to date with new episodes, subscribe to Future Thinkers on your favorite platform. And leave us a review or a like. It really helps out the show. And don't forget to share this episode on social media. Enter the Future Thinkers giveaway and win our brand new community membership, including in-depth courses, private calls, and more, as well as a supply of Qualia, a complete cognitive upgrade for your brain. To enter the contest, simply go to futurethinkers.org slash giveaway and sign up for our mailing list to instantly get our 50-page guide on how to adapt to the future. There are many ways to increase your chances of winning. Enter the competition today. This episode is brought to you by Qualia, a nootropic supplement that helps support mental performance and mood. To get 10% off, use the code FUTURE at checkout. And to learn more about neurohacking, visit futurethinkers.org slash neuro.